That's my night there. <laughs> <laughs> Open mics are fun. Good evening, and it is after the hour, 7 o'clock, and call to order uh, the February 15th Appropriations, Northboro Appropriations Committee meeting. Um, first item on the agenda tonight is the approval of minutes from the February 8th, 2023 meeting. Make a motion to approve the minutes of February 8th. Second. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Were you giving that second to Tim? Uh, Janice. Yes. Moved by Rick, second by Janice. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Meetings are approved unanimously. Next on the agenda is the DPW project update, including pavement management plan, drainage projects, complete streets and sidewalk initiatives, downtown master plan, recreation and parks improvements, and water sewer projects. Uh, before we kick it over to the DPW director, if I may, through the chair, just uh, by way of introduction, we have uh, with us tonight um, Sean Thompson. He's our facilities manager. You heard the library director and the senior center director um, last week sing his praises. Um, so uh, this is him in the flesh. Uh, in terms of this memo tonight, uh, we talk, we focus on budgets and numbers. That's the, one of the things that this committee does to make sure that the budgets are in line with our goals and affordability and all that. But it's not the end. The, the, the end game is the outcome. What are we accomplishing with these, uh, with these monies? And that's really why I asked Scott to include this memo in your packet to walk you through some of the higher end stuff that, that he's getting done because I'll tell you, he's amazingly productive and the uh, amount of projects that are in the works or completed, I think you're gonna be impressed with. So, uh, so that's why he's starting with this and then we'll roll through the, the upcoming fiscal 2024 budget numbers and goals and objectives. But this is an update, it's a status update where we are today. So with that, through the chair, I'll hand it over to the director. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So again, you have our um, Public Works Project Updates Memorandum. It's kind of long, 10, 10 pages, but I'll go through the projects, um, each one of them, as well as how some of them relate to one another. Um, as always, we start out with our pavement management program. We've been implementing pavement management uh, in Northboro since 2014. The uh, funding allocation is approximately $1.1 million per year. We have, we are, our goal and objective is to touch approximately 10% of our roads every year with a variety of treatments. Those treatments can uh, range from full reclamation and reconstruction to simple crack filling. So you'll see on the second page, there's a table that uh, outlines the 22 pavement program, what we, what we did, um, how much of reconstruction, mill and overlay, as well as surface treatments and sidewalks this year. We've started to do sidewalks um, in accordance with our complete streets policy. So this is where things kind of come together with different projects. One of the priorities of the master plan was uh, sidewalk uh, improvements, connectivity, um, pedestrian access around the community. MassDOT has what, what they refer to as the Complete Streets Program. It's a funding mechanism that allocates uh, grant funds to communities that become approved Complete Streets communities. There's a process to become a Complete Streets community. The first step is an adoption of a policy. Uh, the Board of Selectmen adopted that policy. Part of that policy out outlines what we need to do when we rebuild a roadway. Rebuilding a roadway is reclamation. Anytime we reclaim a road and there's an adjacent sidewalk, we have to rebuild it if the sidewalk requires rebuilding. Most of our sidewalks do, not all of them. Um, so last year you'll see we did you know, three quarters of a mile of sidewalk reconstruction. The roadways rebuilt, we rebuilt last year, or you know, recently last year, uh, Stratton Way, Warren Drive, and um, Edmonds Way. Each one of those three roadways has sidewalks, so they had full right sidewalk reconstruction in accordance with this complete streets policy. I'll get a little more into the complete streets later. Uh, so on the bottom, you'll see the graph that tracks our pavement condition index, our PCI. It, it's pretty much like a school grade. A 71 is a low, you know, C minus. Um, you know, we're currently at a 76, which is a solid C. You'll see how it crept up from 2014 through 19. 
and then it dipped a couple years, 2020 and 2021. So again, this will bring a couple topics together, this one being drainage. We've had some uh, culvert failures in the past few years. Lincoln Street culvert failed um, over by Lincoln Street Elementary School. We had culvert failures on Davis Ave and Ridge Road and Lyman Street. Um, Rice Ave also was one of the culvert failures we encountered. You'll see those dips was us reallocating Chapter 90 funds from the pavement program to culvert replacement. Chapter 90 could pay for roads, culverts, sidewalks. When a culvert fails and we have roadway plates, we have to repair it. So that, that's what happens when you lose a quarter of a million dollars, $350,000 out of the pavement management program. You can't keep up. Um, last year we spent 1.2 actually on, on, on the work, and you can see we raised the PCI um, almost three points. So sticking with the, the plan is, uh, uh, gives us the success we're looking for but we have to divert funds when, when uh, catastrophic failures happen. Just if I could chime in we, uh, on this. Scott had proposed uh, after the uh, culvert inventory was done, he had proposed in the capital plan that just like we put $300,000 in the uh, capital budget uh, towards roadway maintenance to hit our target number, that we start allocating every other year funding for drainage sidewalks, drainage sidewalks to start getting those on a funding plan. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, that was all postponed. So um, as I'm sure not to steal his thunder, but we have drainage needs and we have sidewalk needs and we have a plan or at least a, a framework of what is needed financially. What we don't have is a dedicated funding source. Uh, and again, uh, this stuff was postponed due to um, due to the economic factors and impacts of the of the pandemic. So going on on page three and continuing on to four is our sidewalk improvements. A um, couple components of that project. One uh, I discussed earlier about the complete streets, and the second is um, a sidewalk management plan that we've developed. Every other year, um, we have our consultant drive around the community. Um, reassess all of our roadway conditions every year as long as they're doing that I have them pick up some other data one year they picked up all of our guardrails and conditions we have our pavement markings done we have our curb types done sidewalks done um, the sidewalks were assessed for conditions this past year resulting in a sidewalk management plan you can see the graph it's very similar to what we do for a pavement management program different funding levels results in different grades for your sidewalk um, so as John indicated just a minute ago, the capital improvement plan had shown $300,000 for drainage one year, two hundred dollars for sidewalks the next. $300,000, $200,000, $300,000, $200,000. Goal and objective is the three hundred dollars take care of our culverts and our drainage problems. The two hundred dollars keeps us on a somewhat level ground with the sidewalks. Um, that was a goal and objective in the capital plan. Um, you know, providing $300,000 a year to sidewalks would be better. It, provides an improvement to our sidewalk conditions. It is what it is. We have $2 million with an existing sidewalk backlog. The, yeah, I'm sorry. I just asked a question about the, the 2.1 million in existing sidewalk repairs. Is that all sidewalks or is there a way to, it's like a busy road, certain busy roads need to be taken care of before back roads. Like are there sidewalks on back roads that are included in that 2.1 million that just don't get used? Yes, yeah, that 2.1 million um, considers all repair to all um, poor and failing condition sidewalks. So we have you know, four grades of sidewalks. The lower half of the grades um, require $2.1 million to repair. When you develop the, the capital improvement plan as part of the sidewalk management plan, like the last little piece that says how should you spend money for the next three years, and that's when things like that come into play, Mr. Chairman. Okay. You consider the level of service, uh, how, much pe how many people use it, is there a destination? Is there a, is there a, a, a target group? Um, do you have a large neighborhood do that, that needs to go to a specific location? So that's where that comes in. Okay. I was just thinking like uh, kids walking to school. And exactly. Those, those exactly. Sorts of things. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So the complete streets piece of the sidewalks, <coughs> as I indicated earlier, we are now a complete streets community. We're eligible for grants. They will allocate up to $500,000 worth of grants over a five year period to a community. It's not a lot of money. It could be one project for half a million dollars. It could be 10 for 50. Um, 
their, their focus is on uh, connectivity, closing gaps. There are gaps in our sidewalk networks that we're well aware of. Um, for example, when we rebuilt Allen Street like five years ago, we put provisions in the re reconstruction to allow a sidewalk to be constructed on, um, on the side of the road to connect East Main Street down to Hudson Street. It's a logical connection. Hudson Street has sidewalks all the way up and down. You can't get from the Hudson Street area around to the memorial fields um, without tr going through the woods on the aqueduct, and that's not accessible. Um, there are other locations in town. We know there is a very small gap uh, on Hudson Street between um, uh, Cumberland Farms on the other side of the, where the church is down to Center Drive. It's like 150 feet, but it's a gap. You can't get from Center Drive to, to Cumberland Farms without kind of jogging around through the Three Wall Memorial and, and, and back up Blake. Um, part of the Complete Streets process, after you've adopted the policies, develop a priority plan. We have a prioritization plan that identifies 25 projects. The vast majority of them are gaps, like I just described. There are other ones that include um, uh, safety amenities and improvements. So, for example, uh, if you were to build a sidewalk from Assabet Park around um, up Gale and down Monroe, there are some improvements you want for safety. Maybe you want some lighting, some pedestrian scale lighting going up, um, going up Gale, because you're going to be accessing the commercial district. There's no street lighting up there. Maybe there's an opportunity to beautify the area. As part of the master plan uh, downtown um, study that's being done, it's a, a sub study from the master plan implementation Com committee. Uh, they're looking at some pedestrian improvements around the downtown. Blake, Pierce, um, the Church Street intersection, um, the connectivity from Pierce to Hudson. Complete streets would cover installing um, street trees, curbing, so if you were to walk from Four West Main Street to Pierce, you're not kind of meandering through this asphalt, you know, sea. There's nothing but asphalt out there. You can put some nice pedestrian scale lighting, some seating. Complete streets covers things like that. Um, it's a great program. It's not really designed to handle the $2.1 million backlog we have. We are a community. We're working through that process with the Master Plan Implementation Committee on where these gaps need to be addressed. If I may, as it hasn't been taken up, uh, and one of the suggestions was uh, uh, and discussed on Monday's night, uh, Monday night's meeting with the board, selectmen, or select board was you know, the potential to use these one-time one -time ARPA funds to either deal with some of the backlog or to deal with some of these, uh, some of these projects to make some, some headway. So that apparently will be a, a point of a future meeting. Uh, I believe they're going to be discussing it in more detail at their next meeting. One thing to, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, yes. I'm sorry. Um, and just to be clear, it's the town will be eligible for a total of construction you know, up to $500,000 over the next five years. So the cap is... The most, the max that we can get is $500,000. That's correct. Okay. It could be That's one $500,000 project or five $100,000 projects, but five hundred grand is the most you're going to get over that five-year okay. period. One of the um, struggles with sidewalk construction, you can have very simple ones like the Allen Street I described. Good slope. It's got closed drainage on it. It's easy to build. There's adequate property right away there. There's no um, cross slopes uh, or roadside slopes to con be concerned with. There are other locations that are very complicated. There's a gap, a substantial gap between Bartlett Street uh, and Maple Street intersection down to Maple and Ridge. It's a great location for a sidewalk. You got a high school at one end, elementary school at the other, and it connects you up to Route 20. That road is narrow. There are slope issues adjacent to it, and there's no closed drainage. As soon as you put a sidewalk in, you have to have a curb. When you have a curb, the water's got to go somewhere. It's got to go into a catch basin. When the water goes into a catch basin, it goes into a pipe, then it's got to discharge somewhere. I need an easement. So half a million dollars, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's not going to put a simple sidewalk like that in. Um, it's just not adequate. So there's a long process to get some sidewalks in. That's why I asked, because I knew that the cost was yeah. 500000 seems like a lot of money, but you're not going to get a whole lot of sidewalks right. from it. Complete Streets doesn't pay for design and it doesn't pay for land acquisition. So if we were to do that work, we would have to uh, shoulder the, the, the cost of the design services, the survey, land acquisition, drainage uh, 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 design, and obviously town meeting uh, uh, granting of the easements. So it's a long process. Speaking of drainage, the next project we have was the Lincoln Street culvert. Um, 
That failed uh, unexpectedly. We had roadway plates on it through uh, a, a winter season. We were um, provided $300,000 at town meeting for a, the culvert replacement. Due to the uh, supply chain struggles we had um, during the uh, coming out of the pandemic, there was substantial delays in the um, aluminized steel structure you see in the photograph. Um, it took far longer than anybody ever expected to, to uh, receive that culvert. Uh, so much so that the contractor wasn't able to mobilize until August 1st. We had the bid opening in February. Um, contractor was able to complete the project and have the roadway open uh, in, in a little over three weeks. Um, that included um, encountering an, un an unknown uh, high pressure gas main that was really problematic, but um, Eversource came out and worked as a team with us and the engineers, and it, it was successful before the Friday before school opened. So um, that was a great project. And if you all remember, you know, you saw the pavement management graph. What happens if we're diverting money towards culverts and drainage work away from the pavement? You saw that graph going down. This body supported a standalone article for $300,000 to do this project. Remember last year, the economy came roaring back after the pandemic. We had really good, uh, uh, almost a record a level of free cash. And so we were able to do this project with free cash. We also got $50,000 from the state as an earmark. Um, so we were able to get this project done with a standalone amount and didn't detract from the uh, investment in the pavement. So it just shows that difference. But, um, but we don't have that level of free cash this year, and we're not likely to have it moving forward, frankly. Question, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, to, um, you mentioned a uh, uh, high pressure gas main that you encountered. Are those, I mean, high pressure gas mains are um, things that people worry about. Are, yeah. are, do we know where all of them are in the town? Eversource knows where they are. Um, the depths vary. The expectation was that it was going to be much deeper um, when, the, when the sewer main went in there. Um, the mapping showed that the uh, gas main went underneath the sewer, and the design was for the culvert to go over the sewer. So there's two sewers there. There's a gravity going one direction, a force main going the other direction, and there's a water main. Water main is sleeved. The gas was supposed to be sort of on that same, on that same level. Turned out it was a foot and a half higher, so it was kind of going right through the culvert. Um, but Eversource was able to come out. We, they were able to slowly jack the, and raise the, 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 the uh, gas main, and it's, over, it's on top of the culvert, and it's been sleeved. So the, the surprise was the, the precise depth, height, yeah. And yeah. Not, not that there was yeah. one there. Oh, yeah. There's lots of surprises. <laughs> Size, depth, location, yeah. condition. So we had a couple of parks projects kind of completed this past year. The first one you see is the pickleball courts at, um, at Ellsworth McAfee. Um, that project was uh, funded through uh, the CP, CPA. It was a very successful project. We um, um, we got lucky with a very, very good contractor. They do, they specialize in, um, in fields and court construction. There was, again, negative impacts um, due to the uh, supply chain issues, specifically with um, benches and chain link fence. I don't know what happened with the metals industry, but um, they struggled to get uh, fencing. Um, we had to uh, forego certain uh, gates, uh, a series of gates at the location, just because we didn't have adequate funds in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the budget. So we put in bid alternates. Uh, bid alternates included the gates, both between the courts as well as entry gates. And we put in bid alternates for the benches, um, thinking if we get funds later in the operating budget, we can make it happen. Um, but uh, the Board of Selectmen was um, uh, thoughtful enough to award some ARPA funds to supplement this project. Um, those funds were able to get us the, the the gate's constructed and installed, and we're still actually waiting on the benches. Um, benches, I, they're, they're not here yet. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yeah, I, I, so the ARPA funds was to supplement the, the 18,000 I think was to supplement the fencing. But the fencing was already paid for on before? Or was no, no, we, we had, so we had, we had two bid alternates. When you, when you bid a project and you're not sure if there's adequate funds, your base bid is absolutely what you need. You know, it's the core for, to provide the service. And then any of the other things, the, the wish list stuff you could put on is bid alternates. Okay. Um, we knew the budgets were getting tight. We knew the industry was, was, was um, 
the, the, price, the, the prices were soaring, so we put some bid alternates in on okay. the maybes. Okay. So it was kind of because of the shortage and absolutely. And, and that's oh, why definitely the was. Yep. Okay, it definitely. Okay. Was. I was just wondering. Remember, you heard last week, uh, you know, the superintendent we were talking about uh, just the uh, the MSBA's accelerated repair program that they they had a bunch of projects like out to bid. Mm -hmm and they were coming in higher and the price escalation and that's why they paused their grant program. So these were sort of pipeline projects as we were going out to bid, you're seeing the market go crazy, supply chain issues, which the smart thing to do is to you know, pull a few things out that you can potentially do later. Uh, but it was clearly a direct impact of. Right, that, that's you know, what and, and again, when you talk about you know, ARPA funding, it's about, it, it's the, the ARPA funding is meant not just to, to it wasn't meant just for vaccination clinics and the direct it's the overall economic impact you know you have less money to do everything and uh and projects like this so the board released eighteen thousand dollars to get the project basically so as scott indicated we're still waiting on benches um thanks it was a similar story with um the playground at Asabet. Um we bid it out during the um the coming out of the pandemic with there, there was escalation in, in costs Project came out fantastic. The community loves it. Um, the contractor worked very diligently, even through some supply chain issues, to get it opened up the Friday before Memorial Day weekend. Um, I, the park came out beautiful. Uh, the community enjoys it very much. Um, but again, we had to cut some things out out of bid uh, as bid alternates that we couldn't afford. One of them was the chain link fence that went along the uh, the old stone wall that parallels South Street. Um, Again, the Board of Selectmen was, was uh, uh, willing to award some ARPA funds to put that back in the project. Um, a little disheartening to have an entire beautiful playground built and have this old, rusted, bent over chain link fence there uh, where, from every, from where everybody sees it. Um, we did get uh, uh, lucky on that project, though. Um, we pre-ordered and pre-purchased all of the playground equipment. Uh, one process that can be a challenge in municipal procurement is when you want to buy playground equipment or s very specific things that you need and you want, um, it's hard to specify that in an open bidding environment. Um, you have to have uh, three alternates, alternatives that the contractors can bid on. You can't sole source it. Uh, we were able to sole source this through a, a state bid list um, and buy exactly what the community wanted. We did that in advance of this project and in advance of the pandemic. So. We ordered it before the pandemic hit. It got delivered during the pandemic and before the cost escalations went through the roof. Um, so that this was $180,000 with a play of equi play equipment. So it was a substantial purchase, and it was very well timed, even though we didn't realize it was. There's a couple um, enterprise fund. Oh, another same on the parks and rec. I guess I'll push forward to so the dog park and the senior center trail. So we have two projects coming up on, um, on the town meeting in April uh, for construction. One is a dog park. Last year's uh, CPA funds were allocated toward a siting and, and uh, preliminary design for a dog park. That work has been uh, completed. We evaluated four sites, went through a couple of public meetings and public charrettes. Uh, the property on Boundary Street was selected. If you're driving up Boundary Street from Hudson, on the right-hand side, there's a, a parking lot for a trailhead. It's about 350, 400 feet past that on the right-hand side. Um, there's a little level spot there. That's the location. It's town-owned land. The town purchased it in the 60s to build a sewer treatment plant. Never got built. We still own the parcel. It's a great location for it. Um, and our, our town planner uh, was recently, like this week, successful late last week successful in obtaining a $25,000 grant to finish the design services. Um, the Stanton Foundation awards grants for dog park design and construction. Um, she has a lot of experience in this with her prior communities and um, that grant was awarded so now we can go forward with the final design. Uh, we're going to the town meeting in April to fund a portion of the construction. The other portion we're going to apply for the same grant program for construction funds. They have a small pot of money for design, 25000 and they'll give you up to 225 for construction. So um, we're hoping to have a, a, a beautiful dog park built through two funding mechanisms, one in April and one um, through another grant round. Generally, they don't give you the $25,000 design grant if they're not really interested in funding the next construction phase, so that's a really good thing. 
Yes. Was this part of the Heights map? No, it, 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 it abuts it. Um, it abuts when, it. when you look at the parcels between the Assabet River, Hudson Street, and Main, Main Street, Route 20, um, there's a huge DCR property, and that's where that parking lot is, that trailhead parking lot. That's DCR that goes down and abuts the river. Our parcel, um, the town's parcel, is where I described it, 350 feet up from there, and it runs up the hill. And then at the top of the hill is the Heisman property that, that uh, slopes back down toward Main Street. So there's a huge tract of land there that the town owns. Um, part of it is the sewer enterprise fund. Part of it is a general fund. This is on the general fund parcel. All right, thank you. I'm just curious. The um, CPC also funded, or CPA also funded last year's town meeting, the Brigham Street Burial Ground uh, Beautification. Uh, as you go on to Brigham Street, on the uh, from South Street on the left hand side there's an old burial ground there there's a nice little sign we did some ground penetrating radar a few years ago to locate old graves um, this is pre-revolutionary war era and um, there's a lot of dead trees it looks looks horrific with the with the amount of uh, mortality we have there CPA funds have been were awarded to remove a bunch of the trees leave the uh, healthy ones loam and seed the area and install a granite uh, granite post and chain uh, perimeter fence, I guess, for lack of better terms, um, and uh, do a little uh, parking, a little pull-off area for, for for some gravel, so people can observe the um, the informational sign. So that that design work is done. It'll be going out for bid um, in the next couple of weeks, and you'll see that work done this summer. The last CPA project here is um, is the Senior Center Accessibility Trail. Last year, the CPA funds were allocated to do final design services for an accessible trail uh, around the senior center property. The design is nearing completion. There will be two uh, sets of trail loops. One bituminous concrete, the other one stone dust. Um, bituminous concrete will be used on the wheelchair accessible portion, which will go from the patio area behind the senior center down toward down to the lake around the lake there'll be a leg that goes out onto the peninsula with a little vista there it'll go around the lake it'll meet up at the corner where the um, chicka barbecue used to be and it'll continue wrapping around the parking lot through the meadow where the um, swing set is old swing set and then come back up into the into the parking lot and go ac a crosswalk to the entrance of the senior center that's the accessible route the non-accessible route will branch off behind the lake and go all the way up the hill toward the cell tower and then come back down and hook up with the Edmonds Hill Trail. Um, so two loops, one of them wheelchair accessible, the other one not, um, but it's a wonderful project. It's, we're going to be going through environmental permitting in the next month or two and construction will be this summer also. We built the senior center. This was part of the vision and I'm excited to see it being fully realized at this point. Yeah, I always thought there was a sign that said private property over there. That's not private property, then that's our property? The top of Edmonds Hill is, is, uh, is private property. The summit um, trail I know you can go on, but yeah. the other one. I no, when you're facing, okay. if, you're, if you're at the roadway, looking up at the senior center driveway, yeah. there, the, the, all that, there's a portion of land to the right there yeah. that was, that's actually recreation land. When we purchased this property, remember this was the old the uh, game, uh, fishing, game. fishing game, yeah. right? Yeah. It was some of it was por uh, purchased with conservation funds. That's the upper area. Uh -huh. Some was general municipal uh, funds, which is where the senior center is, could be used for anything. And then, again, if you're looking at the senior center from the road, the portion to the right was uh, was purchased using um, okay. with recreational. I thought I saw property. a sign that said private property. That's why I was. Yeah. So, okay. no. This is what's being proposed here is all uh, on uh, on town properties in one form or another okay. recreation or general municipal or conservation land. Okay. All right, thanks. so the last um, project listed and, and part of sort of the general fund piece is um, it's entitled ADA accessibility so uh, the architectural access board and uh, the uh, American Disabilities Act um, supports uh, self-evaluations and transition plans um, Sean helped us uh, with this grant application. What it is is you, you submit it to the, uh, to the state. Um, you ask them to give you funds to do a self-evaluation, which includes, which is performed by an architect. They visit all of your buildings and all of your grounds and facilities. They evaluate um, their accessibility, not just for wheelchairs. It's for um, visually impaired, 
uh, mobility impaired as well as um, hearing impaired. After they've done the evaluation, they prepare a transition plan. The transition plan has, can, can vary greatly on the types of things the rec that they recommend. On one extreme end, it could be an elevator construction. On another end, it could be as simple as putting in a doorbell. You know, if you have a door that a wheelchair can't get to, and it's not financially feasible to make it accessible for a wheelchair, and, and the public doesn't have to get into it, just ring a doorbell. Customer service can come out there and serve you there. Um, so there's a wide range of it. It includes the website. You know, visually impaired uh, persons have a difficult time navigating websites. So there's a component of uh, um, internet accessibility there as well. Um, not only does it give us a, a transition plan to how to um, uh, uh, improve our accessibility, it also opens up the door for grants to, to implement those things. Um, so you need to do one before you do the other. Um, you know, we submitted the application last year. We were not awarded. Um, Sean came on board, worked with me and uh, an architectural firm to help with an, uh, bolster the application, and we were recently awarded. So that work will be proceeding on the next month or two. So that's the general fund stuff. I'll go through the two enterprise fund ones pretty quick. They're back a couple pages. I think they're on, where are they? Yeah, page seven. Thank you, John. Actually, the skater starts on page, the bottom of page six, and page, and then page seven. Yep. So, <laughs> we have two enterprise fund projects. The first one is a, a skater project. The first phase of it was um, funded two years ago from uh, enterprise funds. Uh, skater is a supervisory control and data acquisition plan. That is just a long way of saying um, electrical controls. So, I can, with the SCADA system, you can monitor and control your water and sewer systems remotely. It's a closed network system. You don't get on the internet. You're not, you know, logging in from, from some laptop at a library. Um, and it's, it's highly recommended and promoted by Homeland Security for the security of our water and sewer systems. Phase one is nearly complete. That was, again, that was funded through uh, enterprise funds last year. Phase two, which is the second half of our pump stations. Um, we submitted a, uh, an earmark request to um, a McGovern's office and um, Warren's office. Uh, we were awarded a $491,000 earmark through uh, uh, McGovern's office, through Congressman McGovern. So that's free money, half a million dollars. It does require a 20% match. So you'll see on the town meeting article $125,000 coming out of this, the enterprise funds to support the 20% local match. That'll complete the SCADA process, uh, program for all of the water and sewer facilities in town. Um, substantially bolsters our risk and res resiliency and security of our water and sewer systems. Um, it's a nice win. We submit, we submit air marks all the time. I mean, John just mentioned the $50,000 we got from, uh, I think, Megan's office, uh, uh, Kilcoin's office got it for us. We submit them all the time. And, Rarely, have I, well, that was the first good news I ever got, and this one was the second one. So, <laughs> so it's very happy to very happy to receive that. We actually got a phone call from McGovern and said congratulations. So it's kind of a cool voicemail to get. So I think that summarizes. Well, it doesn't summarize it. That describes all the projects we have. What about your dam removal? Oh yes, thank you. The unpleasant one. Thank you, Janice. So we have a. Uh, uh, the Water Enterprise Fund owns a dam in um, Shrewsbury and Boylston. Um, it used to be a water supply for the community. It was built back in 1880. It stopped being used in, it was built in 1860. It stopped being used in like 1890. Wasn't there, it wasn't used very long. Um, but we still own it. It was deemed unsafe by the Office of Dam Safety, so we have to either remove it or fix it. We have no use for it, so we're going to remove it. Uh, we're utilizing uh, enterprise funds as well as a $168,000 grant from the state um, to do the design and permitting to remove the dam. Um, design and permitting for a dam is very complicated. There's a lot of environmental impacts associated with it. It's a struggle to convince the state that removing a dam and restoring it back to what the original stream bed was is good for the environment. You know, I'm sure if you sit down and have a cup of coffee with the regulators, they'll say absolutely. But the way the regulations are written, it's not written that way. So it's a complicated and long process. That process just got far more complicated um, at the beginning of February. Uh, MEPA, the Massachusetts Environmental Protection Agency, changed their regulations. 
Um, we went from being considered an environmental, um, a beneficial environmental uh, project to requiring a uh, environmental impact report. So there's a drastic difference. One, you just put a letter in the uh, in a, in a in a, 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 uh, an advertisement in the environmental monitor that says we're going to do the dam removal. If anybody has an issue, tell me, and we'll address it. That's easy enough. Environmental notification form, ENF. The other one is an EIR, environmental impact report. That involves a lot of different steps, a lot of uh, analyses on preferred alternatives, and the reason we have to do it is because there an there's an environmental justice community in Shrewsbury. The dam is located in Shrewsbury. MEPA changed their rules. It used to be based on, uh, you know, acreage of impact, millions of gallons of water removed, like big environmental thresholds. If you trip that threshold and you're filling three acres of wetland, you have to do an environmental impact report. They've added environmental justice communities to it now. So because there's an EJ in Shrewsbury, we have to do an EIR. Um, so it's going to cost more money. It's going to take way more time. Um, so we actually submitted another earmark request to fund this um, unfortunate uh, uh, permitting hurdle that we've encountered. Thank you but for reminding me. I didn't even know we owned the dam. This is one of those things where you start in the community, you're like, we own a dam in Shrewsbury? Why? Like, it, the, the records, you know, nobody, it's not on anybody's radar. We just give it to Shrewsbury? We tried. Hmm. I'll sell it to you for a dollar if you want it. I don't want it. You sure? Get the lake with it. <laughs> no, no and everything. No, I am. Um, even though it's going to take a, lot of, a long time, it's not like the dam is threatened to fail or... It just it's it's seen it's been there since 1860. It's yeah, there there are there are criteria. I'm, I I was a dam consultant in, in my prior life. Um, there are criteria that deem a dam to be um, uh, unsafe that aren't necessarily uh, don't necessarily mean the dam's going to fail. In order for a dam to be unsafe, all you really need to have is to not have a mechanism to draw down the water in the event of an emergency. So if somebody drives by the dam, they're walking by, they look at it, they see a big swell and water bubbling out of the ground. If I don't have a way to relieve that pressure rapidly by opening up a low-level valve, that means that dam is potentially unsafe. So that can be, it can be as simple as that, Mr. Chairman. So those are the kind of the, the high-level projects we have going on. Any questions on? Projects. Uh, just by way of orientation, so in your packet you have the finished budget pages for DPW, uh, you have the finished uh, budget pages for the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund, and the Water and Sewer Enterprise Funds. Um, it's, as far as the DPW, um, uh, the Public Works uh, budget, which is what Scott's going to get into, uh, I did you a kindness and provided you with this summary because as you heard last week the big thing that's changed is we have gone from having uh, building maintenance expenses spread out all over the various uh, budgets to consolidating them so on this spreadsheet you can see a summary of the dpw budgets not including the enterprise funds the top one shows what the budget increase is um, with the facilities uh, function in there. And then the bottom one, just so you can see what the budget really is going up when you control for that increase, uh, that's on the bottom. And uh, the second page is uh, a page that was submitted by Sean, uh, facilities manager. And this is sort of a, a cheat sheet to show where all the money came from, uh, from the various departments and funneled into uh, the centralized facilities budget. It's just sort of a, a quick cheat sheet for you guys so you can kind of see what's really what's really happening here so you don't have to hunt through all of the all the budgets and try to figure out what, where the move, money was moved moving from again it's mostly just moving money from individual departments into a centralized account but just as he goes as um sean and and uh, scott go through they may they make make reference to these two documents okay thank you john Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. So I'll go through the bottom of this um, document that John just described. Uh, that's pr probably the easiest place to focus. Um, I'll give you uh, an overview of what the facility budget is looking like to begin with. Sean will talk a little bit about what a facilities division is. 
Um, it is new to Northboro. It provides some, some pretty substantial benefits that we haven't had here forever. Um, so I'll I'll start out with the with the uh, with the general fund. So you'll see um, the proposed change on the bottom under the uh, change column is $193,357, or 6.4%. Um, while the percentage looks a bit high, um, the vast majority of it could be attributed to um, three things: labor adjustments, utilities, and cost escalations. Um, there are no new initiatives in here. Well, there's one. We're, uh, we have a, a CDLA training for our uh, uh, one employee a year, $9,000. Um, um, there's a difference between a CDLB and an A. A is basically the, the tractor trailer. If you're, if you're pulling a truck with a big trailer and an excavator on it, you need to have a CDLA. Um, some of our longer-term employees have CDLAs because that's what you used to do. Some of our newer ones don't. Um, and it's important that they get them because we need to have some more, more diversity in the, in the department, more flexibility, and certainly have a succession planning. So, um, so to, to uh, summarize the 193K increase, 39% um, of that, or 76,000, is directly related to labor, labor increases. Um, as you know, there was a um, class and classification compensation study done. As a result of that, there, was, there were adjustments to some of the labor ranges. So some employees that were not eligible for merit raises prior are now eligible. Um, there are other adjustments in there. The uh, utilities, as everybody knows, everybody has electric bills. Some of us have gas bills. We all have gas or oil. Um, they're going up substantially. We've uh, proposed a 20% increase in the utility line items, or 20% of the increase of the 193K is directly related to utilities. That's $38,000 of additional utility costs. Um, the price of salt has gone through the roof. Um, we're paying substantially more for salt this year than we did last year. Um, we're proposing a 20% increase in the salt cost. It's uh, $37,000. Um, I was astonished at, at the price of salt. It's $76 a ton to be delivered now. It was 62 last year. Um, I, I just, it just keeps on rising. Knock on wood, this year we haven't used as much as we have last year, but we still have a big shed that needs to be filled and you got to plan for the worst. Um, so the remaining 37,000 of that 193, that's attributed to cost escalations of materials. We purchase a lot of materials, you know, mulch, uh, play mulch, um, fertilizer, seed, um, loam for the, for, the, uh, for the cemetery. Everything has gone up as we're all aware. Um, so, you know, there are no new additives we didn't add gonna buy another bench um, signs are more expensive than they used to be last year we put into the budget um, one set of crosswalk signs you know the ones with the rapid flashing lights on them one set isn't a lot a year uh, they're expensive um, last year there was seven thousand dollars now they're nine thousand dollars you know that that's in one year and that's not the post and everything that's just the flashies and the solar panels and the controls um, so again, we've got of that 193, 76 is labor, 38 is utilities, 42,000 in salt, UG, and 37,000 in, in material escalations. And then there's $9,000 added for one CDL licensure per year. Um, when you look at the, the, the facilities budget, the one above, the 271, well, 272,000, this is in a completely new division for the Department of Public Works. It'll be treated just like a, you know, the, the, the parks, the cemeteries, the trees, Highway CM, Highway Admin. Um, 67, approximately 67% of that amount was transferred from other departments. Um, the remainder of it is just part of the original public buildings. So what we did is, um, if you will look at the, the massive spreadsheet that Jason, our, our finance director, has, um, DPW numbers, you know, like, like uh, uh, department numbers are all very similar. Then you got this weird one that goes in there. That's public buildings. It's now called facilities. And that's now under public works. Um, so that money got shifted over. Not all of it. Some of it is still in, in, in the administration, but the vast majority of it came over. And then um, pieces were pulled out of, like, the fire station. The fire department has contractual services for the buildings. They, that stuff comes over to us. 
some of the other facilities. Same thing with the senior center library. No reason for a library director to have to worry about the HVAC filter costs and whether the technician is doing it on time. That belongs here. That belongs with Sean and his budget. Um, so that's kind of the overview of what the facilities budget is like. You want to talk a little bit about what the facilities department is? Yeah, so the facilities department, um, we're really just focused on trying to control costs and get ahead of things in the buildings. Uh, my goal is to address issues before they happen. So we're constantly touching base with the department heads, um, just figuring out what their needs are, any issues that arise, and trying to tackle them before things escalate. Um, it's always better to be proactive than reactive. So by <clears throat> assessing the, the various different systems in the building and keeping up with the recommended manufacturer's maintenance, we're, uh, we're able to cut back on repair costs and just plan better so that we're not in a situation where we were a couple years ago where the boiler fails at town hall and where we're trying to, to get to it um, in a reactive manner. Um, so that's, that's really what our main focus is. Our focus is to allow different departments to focus on their issues and the things they need to do to provide service for the, res, uh, the town residents. And we handle all the, the building stuff and the things behind the scenes. One of the benefits um, in centralizing it is we don't have the senior center director calling her plumber and he does his work. And then the police chief has his plumber who comes over and does his work and everybody's kind of going on their own um, one HVAC company comes in twice a year does all the filters knows what all the equipment is see something odd mentions it to Sean okay you know we, we can we can identify we can address it there's a there's a uh, economy of scale having one firm handle six buildings as opposed to six firms handling you know one one each um, Plus, it's, it's, it saves managerial time substantially. I, I'm a DPW director. I don't know how to run senior programs. And the senior center director should know how to run a geothermal system. Um, it's the right way to run things. So um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to learn a lot about facilities and buildings, which will be fantastic because I was learning on the fly before. <laughs> so it's taking a lot of stuff out of my, uh, as the person responsible for this building, when the boiler breaks or the alarm goes off at two in the morning, I'm the guy that was getting the phone calls. And I'd be standing here with the, with the folks who, with the boiler, because one of the steam traps let loose at two o'clock in the morning waiting for them to tell me they don't have the part, and, you know, and uh, going through that process. So uh, as Sean said, uh, he's taking care of all that, which helps me out as, as the administrator, uh, but also there's less of that stuff happening because he's on top of it and he's assessing. So, um, so it's actually been, it's just been great. It's been a, it's been a, a really a positive, uh, a really positive addition for the organization. Long time coming. Yeah. It helps, um, uh, Sean's helped out, and the department's helped out a lot with some of the capital pieces as well. So we have a fire station project going on um, down in Monroe and um, in West Maine. You saw the, the little house behind there got dem demolished today. Um, demolition of a, of, a, of a building in the Commonwealth is not that easy. There's a lot of permitting associated with it. There's bidding and procurement you need to do. There's uh, uh, hazardous material testing to be done. Um, that didn't fall on John's office. That didn't fall on my own, my office. But Sean was able to manage that project. Um, and uh, it, it was beneficial for all of us. Um, so it's a very, very happy to have a facilities manager. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I always get a kick out of the fact that there's a geothermal whatever right. at the senior center. That's yeah. I'm I thought that was smart to put in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty cool room if you want to be uh, uh, intimidated. You, when, you, when, we were, when we were interviewing senior center directors and you're touring the building and you show them a room that looks like the inside of a nuclear submarine, and they're like, am I responsible for this? And we said, well, I got to die now. Don't worry about <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, two things I just want to point out. In the DPW, uh, again, the DPW budget has all the goals and objectives, many of which have been covered by, um, by uh, Scott. This, every division is explained, um, but I want to draw your attention to page 4-7. That is the overall summary, everything that he, the spreadsheet that he spoke to about the percentage increases and so forth, it's all laid out here. So uh, 
again, if you want to look at that in more detail, um, it's all explained. Every budget has that one or two paragraph summary, page 4-7, that tells you exactly what's ha how much it's going up, why it's going up, and again, we want to respect your time and the public's time to, to get to the, the bottom line, what's changing, what's in motion, and then if you have a question. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is if you turn to page 4-8 and 4-9, they open up like a book. Scott said we're not adding staff. Um, so, but you can see from fiscal 23 to 24, we're going from 20 full-time equivalents to 22. Again, this is just a reallocation. Sean was under public buildings before, uh, as well as the custodian that was half of the position was under my budget here and half was under the police budget because he was shared. So now Sean and the full and the full-time custodian that was shared between town hall and the police station shows up in this matrix. So again, there's an escalation, but there's a corresponding decrease in those other budgets. So I just, I don't want you to look at that and go, hold on, there's two more full-time equivalents. And also, just because I'm a budget nerd, and I know some of you may be, I'm looking at Tim right now, um, we have two uh, personnel tables in here. One is just showing you who the people are and, where, and what their titles are. On the other page, we show you how they're budgeted. So for instance, Scott Charpentier, the director, Half of his salary is budgeted in the DP, is budgeted in the Public Works Department. The other half is split between the water and the sewer enterprise funds. And if you go to every one of those pages, there's a footnote explaining how much of the salary is where. Again, we want to be transparent and user friendly. Uh, but I didn't want you to look at that and say, well, hold on, you know, there's extra people in here. We're just moving the bodies, just like we're moving the funding uh, into a consolidated uh, budget. So this is now the new DPW budget. I think it came out really, came out really great. And uh, again, if there's any questions uh, on it, uh, we're happy to answer. And again, as you go through this in more detail, you you know you have more time to digest it. If you compare it to the other departments about what's in motion, if there's any questions, subsequent meetings, we're happy to answer those. Any questions? I'm actually surprised that, it, that the increases aren't as much as I thought they would be with all the supply chain issues and inflation and everything that's been going on for the last 12 months. So yep. the increases are more than, are much less than I thought they were going to be. And uh, I just also want to mention too the, the um, ADA and how important that is for, for the community to have that work done. I, I think um, the disabled community is often overlooked when communities do this type of work and improvement. So it's just, I'm very happy to see that that's, that's on the agenda for the year, so. It will be nice to um, um, bring something to the DEI that's, cool. that's tangible. Um, yeah. You know, policies are wonderful. Um, implementing, implementing them is very helpful. But doing a true plan and, and having a funding mechanism to, to, to meet the needs, I think, will give the DEI um, um, some motivation, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and, and for the disabled community to have something tangible that the town's right. doing will um, be very welcome. Um, solid waste? I will be happy to go through the enterprise fund, certainly. So uh, solid waste starts out in section 8-1 in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the thick narrative. The bottom of that page summarizes what John was referring to, um, what the budget impacts are. You'll see that the solid waste budget is increasing by a little over 12% or $112,571. The increase is due to two factors only. Um, one is contractual increases that we're obligated to comply with for our collection contractor and our uh, waste disposer, not the, not the recycling, but the waste. Each one of those contracts has an annual escalation. Um, that value is $41,000 out of the 112. The remaining uh, 71000 is solely attributed to the um, recyclable material market. If you, you may recall, when we first engaged this contract, things were very volatile in the recycling market. It was 
primarily driven by China's unwillingness to accept recycled materials back from America. Um, it was an amazing arrangement. We bring in they, containers from there full of stuff. We buy the stuff. We fill it with recycled material, send it back there, and they make it into more stuff that we buy. Um, they lowered their standard or raised, raised their standard, lowered the allowed, allowable amount of contamination in their recyclable materials. So when people, when you read, you know, in the pamphlets and the calendars we give you that says, don't put plastic bags in there, clean the peanut butter out of the peanut butter jar. Well, that's, when peanut butter is in the peanut butter jar, or there's a plastic bag in the recycling, that means the MRF, the material processing facility, can't process that load. They have to hand sort that load. It costs money, the load can get uh, um, uh, rejected and ends up going to solid waste and can't be recycled. So. Is it problematic to have nasty stuff in your recycling bin? Yes. It's costly as well, and the bags and, and cables and things damage the equipment. Um, so it's, it's, it's needed, not just because it can't be recycled, it's because it, it's problematic for the entire recycling stream. Um, that being said, the market is very volatile. Sometimes there's a lot of value to the products, sometimes there isn't. Our contract has um, a varying rate for how much we pay to, to, to get rid of the recycled material. So the recycled plant costs them 100 bucks to process the material. If they can get $25 on the market for it, then it's only a net $75. So how that varies, that variance uh, relates to our contract. Um, and our contract is referred to as a PEG rate. It's just a weird acronym that our vendor decided to use. Um, last year, the PEG rate was very low. Last year, we saw an 80, over an $80,000 80, reduction in the cost to process recycling. That was primarily contributed to cardboard. Believe it or not, during the pandemic, everybody was buying stuff online. There was a massive amount of cardboard in the stream. There was a huge demand for cardboard because you needed a cardboard because you just bought cardboard. Um, it, was, it was everywhere, and the market was high, and there was a lot of product available that was needed. That has changed. So where we went from a, nearly an, well, an $80,000 credit, we're now at an $8,000 credit. So while it looks like the budget's going up substantially, when you go back to the original contract, it's not quite as bad as it, as it is. But it, when you look at one year, it's not good. You know, so the, the peg rate adjustment last year was $80,000, this year it's $8,000. And that's where you get that $71,000 increase. Um, what that does to the, um, to the budget, it doesn't change the bag prices. Um, we've adjusted some of the um, um, internal um, um, budgeting processes. So uh, there's a little more coming out of the general fund subsidy, not much. Um, but we're trying to balance it out and we're taking more money out of the reserves. So you'll hear a little more about fund balance when I talk about the other two enterprise funds. Solid waste is an enterprise fund just like water and sewer. And it's not 100% funded by revenue. Um, it's about 60% funded by revenue. So the bags that we sell bring in a maybe 530, 550,000. The rest is uh, supported by other fees and the general fund. It's pretty good for a community, this community. Other communities will be 50-50. Some are 60-40 the other way. And if I could chime in, just for the record, that is a policy decision. There was a committee that was formed. They studied this for 18 months, came back that we wanted a hybrid of uh, some fee so that uh, people literally have skin, you know, have skin in the game in terms of what they throw away. The more they throw away, the, it, it, the more it costs them. And it also incentivizes people to recycle. Um, but if you were to do it solely based on bag fees, um, the, the, we probably would have driven more people out and just signed up with a private hauler. So there's a little bit of sensitivity analysis that was done, but, uh, but there is a, um, a, uh, a explicit and policy-driven subsidy to the program. So supported by fees to put incentives in place to reduce trash, increase cycling, but there is a, a tax subsidy. When you have an enterprise fund, one of the reasons why you set something like this up as an enterprise fund is to show people explicitly, is it like water and sewer on the other hand, it's 100% funded by fees. There's no tax subsidies and we can prove that and show it. The trash by design uh, is a split. 
um, as a policy decision by the board you know, years ago. And so, um, so we want to be explicit about that as well. And by the way, in that section, uh, as we always do with the enterprise funds, we have a lot of a lot of detail and a lot of history. So you can go back and know like, when we adopted the program, how it's structured, why it's structured that way. Uh, but I don't want people to think that uh, a subsidy is new. It was uh, originally conceived of that way with the subsidy, and the subsidy does bounce around a little bit based on a number of factors. Uh, the other thing I'll share with you is I've been doing solid waste contracts for 25 years. This is the most complicated contract I've ever seen, and it's because we're now, the commodities market is in shambles, and the haulers, if you want, if you want to eliminate all the risk and you say, you know what, just give me a flat rate, the market's going up and down, they're going to give you a very conservative number on their part, which means you're going to pay more up front. If you want to take all the risk, they'll give you a lower number. What we've done, designed here is sort of a sharing of it, and so it moves around, and there's a sort of a after the fact accounting, so it's sort of like a rolling, almost like a little rolling uh, sharing uh, factor. Anyway, um, it's complicated. It was complicated to negotiate, it's complicated to administer, and this is the last year of this contract. Uh, so it's been a five, it's a three year contract, two year renewal, we're in year five. So we are going to go out to bid during fiscal 2024. The trash contract will either go out to bid or be renegotiated, in which case we're anticipating it's going to go up and we'll sort of have to revisit the fees and the subsidy as part of that process. So uh, it's nice when you lock in a good, the first contract we had with this group was a, a, we had a five year contract with no escalation and no exposure. And you know, by the end, everybody's trying to get out of the contract, but we held, we held the hauler to it. Uh, this particular hauler we've had for over 10 years now. Trash is not required to be bid out under the procurement laws for the simple fact that, could you imagine if you had to take the low bidder with trash? Yes. Um, so this hauler has been very responsive, easy to work with, minimal complaints. So uh, if we can, I'd like to keep working with this hauler, but you know we do want to do our due diligence and make sure that we are getting the best price for the community well so that will all take place during fiscal 2024 so all this stuff is going to you know hopefully we'll try to lock in another uh, three-year contract with two-year options but in order to be fair to everybody because nobody knows what's going to happen in the recycling commodities market we have to have these these moving factors otherwise you'll either pay through the nose or or you'll eat it all you'll take on all the risk. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're not we're by far not the only community doing this other communities are at the end of their contract and they're negotiating things right now. Um, we have, we've uh, discussed this with our hauler, we've discussed this with our peer communities. Um, there's a lot of different approaches and that analysis on what's best for Northboro, that's what our FY24 efforts are gonna be. So we can put together a good plan going forward. There's basically variable costing. Yes. Yeah, what, hap what, what a lot of communities are, are going toward is, uh, so we, we, we contract with our, co with our hauler to pick up trash, and then we contract separately with the disposal company um, where the trash gets dumped. Two contracts. For recycling, we contract with the hauler to pick up the recycling and get rid of the recycling. So the hauler has that risk about the commodities market that John is referring to. A lot of communities are taking that risk out of the hauler and contracting directly with the receiving facility. So we got one, one, one receiving facility that takes our trash, we contract with them, another one that takes the recycling, and then we hire a guy to pick up trash in a truck and recycling. A lot of communities are going that way. Um, the haulers prefer it, obviously, because their, their business is moving stuff with trucks. Um, so we're still weighing out our options, but a lot of communities seem to be leading in that direction. Well, what it means is if you've got this variable and you don't know what's going to happen, it means you need to have enough uh, flexibility within your budget to manage the, the range that that commodity is likely to bounce around. So. Well, that's why we have a fund balance. You know, we have a fund balance for years like this where unexpected things come up, and you'll hear us at town meeting asking to utilize more fund balance um, in order to uh, balance the FY24 operating budget. Next enterprise fund we have is, fund, fund, is, um, is uh, the water enterprise fund. <coughs> A water enterprise fund budget is proposed to go up 
$135,249, that's 5.1%. Page so, 8 9. Yep, sorry. So the new budget is at approximately $2.8 million, $135,000 increase. Uh, the, the, uh, the increase is majority, the majority of the increase is attributed to reestablishing programs and uh, piece, components in the budget that were removed um, as a result of the pandemic. You'll remember a couple of years ago, we were assessed a substantial increase in the MWRA assessment, um, over a quarter of a million dollars, and that was a direct result of the pandemic. Um, how the MWRA bills is they bill you based on last year's use. It's like our quarterly water bills, but it's a, it's a, longer, it's a longer window, it's a one-year use. So what happened during the pandemic was the city of Boston shut down, Everybody stayed home, people stayed in Northborough, so we use far more water and Boston used far less. That was during the pandemic year. The next year, the MWRA looks back and says, oh, Northborough, your percentage of, uh, of use was higher than it was in previous years. In Boston, your percentage of use was lower. So Boston's assessment went way down because they didn't use as much the prior year. Ours went way up. Think of it like enrollment at a school, right? The budget is the budget, but your share of it will fluctuate based on how many kids you send. How, many, how much you flush the toilet depends on how much we pay, so. Exactly, so we, we had substantial budget cuts um, the year after the pandemic. We eliminated a lot of programs and we cut down a lot of, one of our substantial cushions. We have an, uh, an, um, an unallocated fund, $75,000 for an emergency, something big happens. We had something big happen at Brigham and uh, Main Street, I think, five years ago. That was a $70,000 water main break. That's what the money's there for. Um, we didn't have that last year because of the pandemic. So we're re-implementing a few of those things. We're putting $50,000 back into that emergency fund, bringing it from $25,000 back up to seventy five, dollars where it should be. We're also uh, putting half of our hydrant replacement program back in. We eliminated that entire hydro replacement program to accommodate that MWRA assessment increase. Um, so those two together, the $50,000 and the hydro replacement, add up to uh, $70,000. So we have a $135,000 uh, increase. That's about half of it. And just so we're clear, that emergency fund that stays in this budget, if it's not used, it's retained by the enterprise fund. So it's not spent unless needed. So we're getting that cushion back in. Just like the Appropriations Committee holds and manages $175,000 for the overall budget in case of an emergency. If it's not used, it just falls back into free cash. And you'll see at town meeting when, uh, when we ask for <coughs> utilization of fund balance to, to balance the operating budget for the fiscal year, that number uh, undulates based on where the revenues are projected. Um, last year was really high because we had a very high assessment. I, I asked for a quarter of a million dollars at the microphone, a little more than that, in order to balance the budget. We don't use it, it stays in the, in the fund balance. We don't use the 75K, it goes to the fund balance. Um, the, the goal and objective of, of a fund balance for an enterprise fund is to have 75 days of operating money in, in the bank. That's 20%, that's the goal. Um, you build it up when you have a capital project coming, you know, you, you get extra money, so when you spend down on your capital, you're back down to that 20% that window. Um, something bad happens, you're below it, you build it back up. So that's, that's the, I run, I run a couple small businesses and I can't make too much money and I'm not allowed to lose any money. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a struggle, but the fund balances are healthy. Um, and we're on our way to reestablishing re all the cut programs. So again, half of that 135K is attributed solely to reestablishing programs. <clears throat> The remainder of it is cost escalations to materials. There are no new initiatives in the water division this year. There's uh, the salary adjustments, the labor adjustments that I discussed under the general fund as well, um, and utility costs um, have increased. The utility costs on the next enterprise fund are far more substantial. Sewer pump stations use a lot of electricity. So Scott, can you just speak for a minute? Unlike uh, general uh, fund, um, budgets like the general DPW budget that are funded with tax dollars. Uh, these are fund, the enterprise funds are funded solely through fees. So can you just speak to a moment yeah. about, because it, it's one thing to talk about what the budget's doing, but real, really what people care about in terms of enterprise funds is 
what's happening to my to the to the rates? Are they going to go up? Or are they going to stay level? So can you speak to that? Sure. So, um, so as John indicated, um, and I just mentioned, we're a small business. Um, we everything we provide on the water division is from um, the users, the customers. All right, the customers pay their water bills. That supports the entire water system. Um, our rate study is done annually, and it's done. It's 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 manipulated multiple times a year. So we do our rate studies to evaluate what our revenues look like, what our expenses look like, and what our fund balance looks like. That allows us to establish our, a rate increase or to maintain the existing rates. That's looked at again when we're developing on our operating budget. I look at that at the six month window. Where are the revenues? How much, what's the water use like? If I had a drought, people use a lot of water, the revenue is high. If we have a, a, a cool summer, not a lot of water use, the revenue is low. Um, conservation is a, is, a, is a revenue struggle. So I, can, I tell everybody, all my customers, because I'm mandated to, and it's the right thing to do, use less water. Low, low flow shower heads, water your lawns with your hose, with your hand hose, not with, not with a sprinkler. Use a rain gauge. If it rained last night, you don't have to water your lawn. So I'm telling my customers, don't buy my product. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a business struggle. So the rates get evaluated halfway through so we see where we are on the revenue side, and then we do it again on the capital process. Before we purchase, uh, before we even consider a capital article, can I pay for it out of the fund balance? Can I pay a portion out of the fund balance? If I can't because it's a big thing, like actually removing the dam, I bury that into my rate study and I decide how do I get the loan? Do I want to get a bond because I'm in a a very uh, uh, fiscally responsible community like Northboro and I get amazing <laughs> rates, God bless you. Or do I want to go out to the uh, SRF and get a, uh, a higher interest loan through the state? Um, how do I want to find And then I structure that thing out 20 years or 10 years or whatever the life of the loan is and see what the rate impacts are there. Um, so there's a, a balancing act with the rates. I'm actually presenting next month on this whole process. Um, we look at it all year long, every quarter. Um, the projections right now, because our fund balance is healthy, the revenue streams are exactly where we projected them, I'm looking at a zero to a very minimal um, rate increase. CPI normally, 2.5%. I don't want to talk about the last year or two because it's ridiculous. Generally, things go up 2% maybe. Water use goes down on average about a half a percent just due to conservation. So every year, Two and a half percent, roughly to three percent, um, the, the 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 revenue is going down. The value of my dollar is going down as a business. So, maintaining level service, not touching the re the the, the, um, the reserve fund, two and a half percent rate increase every single year keeps level service across the board. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants a rate increase every year, but they also don't want to have flat rates and then get hit with ten percent. Um, so it's a balancing act um, that we do every single year. Frequent um, incremental increases, keeping pace with the cost of doing business, is our is our, our our model. So all these, when you talk about these big projects, all that's baked into that that two and a half three percent increase that is necessary to to maintain balance over the years. So I save up for a vacation for my family. I save up to. And the, dam. And so, so I do want people to think, well, the, the budget's going up 5%, so my rates are going up 5%. That, that, that's not the case. Right. It's, it's a smoothing. The rate setting is a smoothing process out over capital projects that come and go and, and so forth. Okay. Anything on water? But in case anybody's curious, 80% of residents have water. That's why you do it as an enterprise fund. There's a 20% that are on wells shouldn't be paying for the 80 percent who are receiving town water. That's one of the, that is the primary reason I had no desire to request anything for the enterprise funds out of ARPA. ARPA was supported by the taxpayers to the federal government. The federal government gave taxpayers money back. 30 percent of the community is served by the sewer division. 70 percent are not. That 70 percent should not be using their tax dollars through ARPA for the other 30. I just think it's wrong. That's my little soapbox. <laughs> I agree. <clears throat> okay. Any questions? Great job. Oh, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll end with the with everybody's favorite uh, mm -hmm. sewer. 
just again in your in your packet starting on page 8-12 is the like a two-page summary of the history of the sewer system in Northboro. so um, it's it's it really is a nice you can read it in a, in a couple of minutes and understand exactly how we got here from 1960 to present so thank you John so on 815 is where we start the, the budget um, budget discussions on the sewer enterprise fund and sewer enterprise fund is run just like the other two enterprise funds um, it's very similar to water enterprise fund it's 100 percent supported by the by the rate payers people often call and ask why is my sewer more expensive than my water well it's much more expensive to make sewer water clean enough to discharge into a into a stream than it is to take drinking water and make it clean uh, surface water to make it clean enough to drink it's just a completely different standard pond water is a lot cleaner than sewage um, so the proposed budget for FY24 for the sewer enterprise fund is approximately 2.5 million dollars that includes a hundred and ten thousand thirty one dollar increase or approximately four point six percent as the other enterprise funds as I described, there are no new initiatives associated with this. Um, of that $110,000, one is it attributed to labor, utilities, and Marlboro, the Marlboro use charges. Sewer Enterprise Fund uses a lot of utilities. Every single pump that we have runs off of electricity. The Sewer Enterprise Fund utility line item is going up $45,000. The Marlboro use is going up another $45,000. And then the, the rest of it is attributed to labor and some minor uh, cost escalations with materials. Um, Sewer Enterprise Fund doesn't purchase a lot of materials. We don't treat, so we don't have a lot of chemicals. Um, those with treatment plants are seeing uh, extreme increases in their costs this year. Um, Marlboro, we're proposing, we're, we're uh, uh, projecting a 5% increase on our, on our uh, Marlboro assessment. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, all of Northboro's um, sewage uh, that's collected goes to the city of Marlboro's Westerly Wastewater Treatment Plant. 99% um, of it goes through the pump station on Hudson Street. We drive down Hudson Street, but right before you get to uh, Colburn, right hand side, there's a little brick building, beautiful brick building. That's our primary sewer pump station. That runs a force main through the woods, parallel with Hudson Street, and discharges directly into the sewer treatment plant. Um, we have, uh, we, we're, we're we, we were forced to discharge our sewer to the uh, Marlboro treatment plant in the late 60s. Um, the state would not allow us to build our own plant on the property you were referring to earlier um, because it was right next door to another sewer treatment plant the Marlboro was building. So as John terms it, it's a, it's a forced marriage. Um, and we're in court now, so it's become abusive. <laughs> uh, but the court process is, is moving forward. Um, we're actually in a special master process right now. I'm not going to say there's light at the end of the tunnel, but I feel Let like me, I'm in a tunnel. I'm going to interrupt you sure. for a moment. Uh, so we are in litigation with the city of Marlboro, and I'm not, I'm not going to say anything that isn't, isn't public information at this point. Um, we had, an inter we had a, a, a long term 20 year intermunicipal agreement with them. We had multiple 20 year intermunicipal agreements of them accepting our sewerage. Town of Northboro contributed to the building of the sewer treatment plant. About 30% of it we paid for. And so when that sewer treatment, when that last intermunicipal agreement expired, um, Marble was unwilling to enter into another one because they were trying to get an expansion to the plant. Everybody's waiting for the uh, EPA to issue the permit. And uh, all the history of this is right here in the document. The bottom line is we got into a dispute over what is an appropriate fee for us to be charging. Marlboro um, tripled the fee to the, to the town of Northboro. Now this is an enterprise fund, so you know, it would have basically bankrupt the enterprise fund. Uh, that was the dispute, and we went to court, and the court decided that the fee that Marble was trying to charge Northboro was arbitrary and capricious. In other words, if you're charging me a fee for service in the public realm, it has to be based on what it costs you to provide that service. They can't make money off of us any more than Scott can make money off of his customers. So what the court did not decide was what the appropriate fee is. 
And because it's so technical and complicated, the judge assigned a special master to, uh, to hear that portion of the case. And so we're in that process now. We're scheduled April 10th uh, to basically have that hearing with the special master, who then will report back to the judge. This is how, so the fee was arbitrary and capricious, but this is how we believe a fair and equitable fee would be charged. So that's where we are in the window. It, uh, we had exposure, Marlboro was looking for over $13 million plus 12% compounded interest. Um, that's been thrown out. So, so, and again, all we've ever wanted to do in this is pay our fair share, but we have a fiduciary responsibility to the ratepayers of Northboro not to accept um, a tripled rate that had no backup to it. So that's where we stand right now. So we still don't have an IMA. We're hopeful that once we can get agreement on what the appropriate fee should be, um, then we're hoping that would translate into a new long-term intermunicipal agreement. That's kind of where we are right now. Again, willing, able, and we have planned, as Scott has uh, alluded to, is you know, we've been raising our fees knowing that a settlement will come. So it's not going to be as though uh, we're going to settle with Marlboro and then the rates are going to go up 200%. We've planned for this. Uh, what we th we've planned for what we believe is a reasonable rate increase. So it remains to be seen what the court decides. But, um, but I'd rather, when, when you don't have, when you feel like you're not negotiating um, with the party that's being reasonable, it's helpful to have a third party who has the expertise to mediate. And essentially, that's why we wound up in court. So, so that's where we are on that. So we'll, you know, uh, thank you, John. I'm building on that. We have a line item in our, in our operating budget for a Marlboro assessment. That line item is adjusted annually. Um, the adjustment is my projection. Some years it's 10% if it's been a, a very challenging year. Other years it's 5%. Um, the money that is not utilized, just like I uh, indicated in the Water Enterprise Fund, if we don't use the money, it goes back into the, into the uh, fund balance. Um, that's been the case um, on the Sewer Enterprise Fund. So, you know, as John indicated, we are responsible with our finances. We do what is right, and we do what is prudent, which is to budget appropriately for the bills from Marlboro if they were applied to us appropriately. And we've been doing that all along. So there are adequate resources, like John indicated, we're not going to have to triple the rates when, when something comes, uh, comes to fruition with the, with the courts. One of the things that helped us, frankly, is the fact that we follow national best practices and we run our sewer service as an enterprise fund. So we were able to show and account for exactly what we use and how we use it. One of the complicating factors for the city was they don't run it as a enterprise fund. So it's sort of commingled and it's unclear what expenses are <coughs> sewer related and general fund related. And so you know, we spent a great deal of time teasing all that out in, in uh, court testimony. And at least on that side, it bore out for us. So, so again, no, no substantial initiatives on the on the sewer side. Utilities went up 45. Marlboro went up 45. That's 90,000 out of the 110. You know, so the relative 15 is small increases here and there for costs. What I'll do when I adjust costs is I'll look back, I'll do a five-year look back, see what the average is, throw out a weird year if something odd happens. You know, if I get equipment purchases and I had to buy a motor one year and it was a $12,000 motor, I'll throw those out. Um, and that, those, those numbers undulate around. So that's, that's where we are with the enterprise funds. <clears throat> Any questions? I know it's a lot of information, but literally everything that he said is summarized and written in user-friendly format, and I encourage anybody watching at home to read it. You want to know the history, respect the time, nice summaries. The narrative was pretty user-friendly, too. Yes. It's, uh, I'd just like to make a comment. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say thank you very much, Scott. You've been terrific for the past few years. Uh, I, I like the presentations. I think you've done an excellent job, and I, I hope that you do good work. It's been a pleasure working with you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're pretty good at what you do. <laughs> I try hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, we Thank you. Too big of a head. Thanks, guys. Yes. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so our next meeting is February 22nd uh, at 6 p.m.? Yes, it's at 6 p.m. because we'll be bringing the school department in, so the superintendent will go through the K-8 budget as well as the high school budget. That's uh, too. I tried to bring ACIBIT in uh, in terms of an updated uh, for you tonight. They cannot make that date. They have another commitment, so they're actually going to come in on the March 8th date with police and fire. Okay. So, but the line share is the K-8 and the uh, high school. Yeah. I will send you, if we haven't already, we'll send you links to those budget. Uh, we do have some substantial increases. Right now the K-8 budget is at 4.9% and not anticipated to go down. Uh, the high school assessment is around uh, 5, 5.5%. I'm not sure if that's been finalized yet. Um, so we do, again, I think you'll hear from the superintendent, not to steal his thunder, but uh, it's the special education costs that he can't control. So, you know, we try to set back in December a reasonable target increase, and our target increase was 3.5% for the K-8 budget and the general government. If somebody cannot make that for a legitimate reason, we want to hear that, hear, hear them out on that. So um, so it's, it's going to be more than was anticipated, but, you know, again, there will be times, there have been times where uh, we've set a target a couple of years ago. The municipal budget came in a little bit more, and the schools came in less. So I think the, the value here is in, in, you know, we set these targets so that, not because they're hard-line targets, but so that people have some sense of this is a reasonable increase based on these assumptions. If those assumptions change, like the cost of special education, well, then that's new information that needs to be taken into consideration. So. Um, so the numbers are going to be higher than we thought, um, but uh, but we'll hear them out, and uh, you'll make an assessment on whether or not you think it's reasonable. Well, it sounds like it's driven by student need, so. Yes. So that's uh, your next meeting. Thank you. Uh, any other business? Did I see that you can have the warrants today, or that was a mistake? Um, we'll get those the summary to you next uh, at your next meeting. So um, we'll get we have working on a summary. Right now it's just a summary of the articles, but you know I don't know what's going on. I think they know that I'm leaving, but everything seems to be coming in a little bit late. Uh, and then we had some modifications based on the votes that were taken at the select board meeting on Monday. So one project will come out, and you know all the numbers are going to change. So. Uh, but we'll get that to you for your for the next meeting. Whatever. I just was curious. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And the CPC just finalized their projects as well. So, okay. so those, everything's shuffling around, but we'll get that to you next week. Thank okay. you. Uh, motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Moved by Janice. <clears throat> Second by Rick. All those in favor? Any opposed? We are adjourned. For the record, 8.35 uh, is the adjournment. <laughs>